First Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse number 18. We've been in First Peter since September of last year, working our way through it verse by verse. First Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Give you a couple seconds here to get there. <coughs> 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25 says this. This is the word of the Lord. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who just, judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You may be seated. Anybody can wake up and go to a job they love where they are treated fairly, paid a good wage, and honored for their labor. Anybody can do that. Anybody can sit in an education institution where truth is taught, political agendas are not served, students are respected, and instructors are fair in their assessments. Anyone can tip a waitress that does a phenomenal job, always filling the drinks and getting the orders right, checking on the table, but not too much. Anyone can live in a country or a principality where justice is served, politics are balanced, politicians are eth uh, ethical, and checks and balances are in place. Anybody can live in those sort of environments. But the reality of it is, is that we don't always live in that world. So what happens when an imperfect pagan world, and what I mean by that is an unbelieving world, collides with our call to live holy lives and by virtue of that call, be servants? I'll tell you what happens. It's called tension. The tension that occurs between how we know we should live and what we actually end up doing in. The Word of God and the Spirit of God resides within us. To help us resolve that tension by closing that gap between what should be and what actually is by the Spirit empowering us to walk out honor to Christ. So let's look at the Word and what it has to say about this. We'll go back to verse number 18 and reread it again. <coughs> it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Now remember, this book was written 2,000 years ago, although still very applicable, inspired by the Holy Spirit to our situations today, but it was written 2,000 years ago, which means sometimes going back and getting some historical context helps us in our understanding of the Scriptures in proper framework. The Apostle Peter is writing to several territories that are under the influence of the Roman Empire, not just the influence, but they're under the control of the Roman Empire. And because of that, we have to consider that in how we look at this. Now, the Roman Empire's workforce contained master-slave relationships. When we think of slaves in our modern terminology and understanding, we always think of something supremely negative. And yes, there are certainly a lot of situations, and there were some in the Roman Empire where slaves were treated less than dogs. They had no rights. They had no legal recourse. When treated unfairly, they owned nothing. They were not allowed to own anything. They were underfed, malnourished, worked in harsh conditions. They were beat as discipline for their failures. Aristotle wrote, a slave is a living tool and a tool is an inanimate slave, which really gives you a grotesque picture of the, the, the intellectual framework and the understanding and perspective of that. Well, that was true, and while that is true, that wasn't the case for every situation. The reality is in the Roman Empire, a vast majority of slave-owner relationships were actually 
really respectable. Some masters loved their slaves. They would actually give them a room in their house to live uh, where they didn't have to pay for it. They would treat them as a member of the family. Some of them even included them in on the family's will. Their relationship developed to that point. They'd sit at the dinner table and eat with the family and they would be treated as such. They were beloved. So even in the modern American workplace, you'd be kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Obviously, employees have rights, and, and uh, hopefully on Monday morning you go to work, you're not getting beaten whenever you make, make a mistake. But most employees aren't treated like family and live with their boss. Maybe you were given a free turkey at Thanksgiving, but you weren't at the Thanksgiving meal of your boss's family. Maybe you have that relationship, but most people don't. So <coughs> we have to understand that not all slave master situations were bad like we think them to be currently. And those in the Roman Empire might look at our workforce and see some similarities. They might see some situations where there was some common love and and care and concern that went back and forth. And so in addition to that reality, most of the church in that time frame was most likely made up of slaves as opposed to the rich that hired the slaves to work. Most of the population were slaves. Most of them had to work uh, uh, for someone who had the ability to hire them to to take care of their properties and different things like that. A lot of the New Testament, because of this, is written within the framework of the author speaking to a lot of people who were slaves. And that's why when you read it, the Holy Spirit inspired these authors to use a lot of certain metaphors to describe spiritual principles using master-slave language, such as "There's no, you are no longer a slave to sin. That would have been very familiar to that audience because that terminology would have resonated with them. Jesus also used a few parables using the master-slave language and scenarios to help his audience understand what he was teaching because he knew it would have been very familiar to who he was talking to. So the scriptures make a bit of emphasis out of this and understanding the culture, we can now see why because this was a common thing and it wasn't always perceived. Of course, there were bad situations and good situations, but it wasn't always perceived to be something incredibly bad. (coughs) It was a part of their lives is what, what I guess I'm saying. Now, Part of the reason there was a need for this teaching about servants being honorable to their masters was that there were some Christians that were developing a mindset that because they were no longer slaves to sin, they were no longer slaves at all. So they would hear things like this, 1 Corinthians 7, 22, for he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman in, of the Lord. Likewise, he who, uh, who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. They would also hear things like Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no uh, male and female, for you are all, all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this verse is uh, one of the most used and abused and twisted and contorted scriptures um, that I have seen uh, uh, throughout our culture. This does not mean that these distinctives are removed from the world. Is there still male and female? Obviously. Are there still Jews that exist? Clearly. Are there still Greeks or Gentiles? Clearly. Are there still people that work and people uh, that hire people and people that have to work for others? (coughs) Clearly. This isn't saying we're wiping these distinctives in the world and in our culture. What it's saying is no matter the role that you play or no matter what God has called you to in this life and any of these distinctives that God does in humanity, We are all under the same heading as sinners that have been redeemed in Christ. He looks at us through that same lens, although some of these distinctives are created by God and are there for a purpose. They're good, okay? And so they're, they're reading this and they're saying, oh, I'm not a slave anymore, and so I can buck up against my master and say, you can't tell me what to do because I'm now a Christian, which means I'm no longer a slave. And the apostles had to step in and say, ah, that's not what that means. They assumed that their newfound freedom in Christ meant that they were free from their masters as well, but the scriptures are clear. That's not what's going on here. And so there was a, a, an, an idea that they had, to be, they had to be corrected, a bunch of church leadership, and they had to say, no, 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 you're free in Christ, but Christ has still called you to this particular employment situation. 
And that in that, you have to be honorable and you do have to respect your masters and work for them as you're working for Christ. Now, there was another problem developing. Some individuals who were slaves were fulfilling leadership roles in the church, such as elders. And so in some places, you had believing masters who were sitting in congregations that were subject to the spiritual authority of one of their own slaves that was serving in the church as an elder. This is a little bit awkward, right? Monday through Saturday, I need you to farm the land. I need you to attend to my family. Some of them are doctors. I need you to attend to my family's medical needs. I need you to wash the dishes. I need you to prepare our meals. On Sunday, the roles are reversed, and I said under your doctrinal teaching and spiritual leadership. And so there was some tension that was developing where the masters still thought they were masters in the context of the church, and the, the uh, slaves, in the context of being in the home of the master, then started exerting unnecessary and inappropriate authority over the master in that context. So <clears throat> in fear of what the apostles feared might be a slave rebellion, due to this, these misunderstandings, the apostles had to step in and remind them that this, they're not relieved of the workplace duties. And in fact, they were to double down. Regardless of rather their master was a good master who was kind and, and, and thoughtful and loving, whether that was the case or whether they had an unfair one, they were to double down on servanthood. So let's go back to the verse. The word servant in the Greek, the original language of the New Testament, which is Koine Greek, the word is euketes, euketes, and it means a household slave. Some were farmers. Again, some were uh, medical doctors. They actually treated the family's medical needs. Some of them took care of the kids and ran them on their errands and different things like that. And then we go and say, (coughs) servants are to be subject, which is hippotasso, which means to place yourself under them. So place yourself under them. This is is an idea of, of there's an order. I'm still going to be subject to my master. And then it goes on to say, with all respect, this is without bitterness or negativity, with gracious honor. And then the last part, and this is the hardest part for every single one of us in this room, not only to be good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Now, the word unjust here in the Greek is scolios, which is where we get the English word scoliosis, which is a twisting of the spine. So this refers to a master that is dishonest, unfair, unreasonable, twisted, perverse, and crooked. Literally has a crooked backbone. Paul gives us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the exact same message in Ephesians. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. <coughs> Knowing that, whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. And so even the, the masters who were becoming believers, Christ had to come in and say, whoa, 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 whoa. You have to do this whole employment thing way differently now. Now you represent me in the authority structure that I've set on earth and now you must treat them with no partiality and treat them with love and kindness. So in the workplace, believers are to submit to their employers as if they were serving Christ himself. You want to talk about a counterculture message, that's it. Now, does that mean you stay in your current job in light of unfair treatment? That's not necessarily what this means. All situations are different. Now, again, in the, in the Romans context, it wasn't like us where you could just like quit a job and go find another one. Like you either did this or you, 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 you got lucky and found another home because you knew someone or you just flat out were broke and didn't eat. So you, you couldn't always just quit your job and go work for someone else. <clears throat> so how do we deal with in our modern context where you can do that? If it's time to go to another job and the Lord has laid it upon your heart to do so after careful scripture reading, prayer, and fasting, 
then do so. But when you do so, how can you still follow the scripture? Don't dishonor them on the way out. Don't try to stick it to the boss on the way out. Don't try to blow the stack off the place and, and, and plant rumors and, and, and start a bunch of garbage and, and drama and, and throw everybody under the bus and say, I don't care, I'm on my way out. Well, you have to understand, you may be leaving a place that you don't have to go back to anymore, but Christ is watching and your character matters. But what if God hasn't called you to move on? What if God isn't telling you to move. He's telling you to stay exactly where you're at, regardless of the unfair treatment. There could be coworkers that are there that you are called to minister to in the midst of that situation. An unreasonable and unfair scolios boss is not a reason to usurp God's plan for your life. If he wants you to stay, then you stay and you serve your boss like you were serving Christ, not in worship, but in servanthood. Now, what if my boss or my HR department asked me to do something that's anti-biblical? Well, here's the deal. That Christ is not asking you to serve other people to the extent to where you offend his holiness. You don't. Your primary allegiance is to God. Now, I'm not talking about gray stuff and personal convictions. I'm talking about if your workplace, your boss, whichever, says you have to do this, and it is against the word of God, your primary allegiance is to him. He's not asking you to be a servant to the extent that you offend and break God's holiness and you sin against him. And so in these ways, your primary allegiance is to God. You, you refuse. You can't. Christ is your highest master. But in how you respond to those situations, you can either respond like a jerk or you can respond like a servant in honorable ways. You don't have to bull in China closet everything. I know some of you are just naturally bull in China closets. Raise your hand if that's you. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Okay, we've got a few. Okay, you're just a bull in a China closet everything. You don't have to bull in a China closet this. All right? You can still be a servant. You can still be honorable while you say, thank you for allowing me an opportunity to work here, but at this point, I cannot offend a holy God by doing that, and so I need to move on. And, and I would, at that point, I would take that as God's confirmation that it's time for you to move on. Sinning in the name of servanthood is just serving Satan, right? We don't extend this all the way to sinning. God is our ultimate and supreme authority. That's not what he's asking. Now, You want to talk about our theme for this year, counterculture. All of this is really counterculture. Most employees are are, are marching around. Maybe some of us have been guilty of this, demanding their rights, trying to overthrow the authority of their superiors or not really respecting it, minimally gossiping about them at the water cooler or showing up late on purpose just to stab them. Or maybe you've been in these situations where you, you, you sort of put your boss in an impossible situation just so you can sit back and watch them squirm. Or maybe you enjoy seeing them not do well. Maybe you, you enjoy watching them be in really tough situations. Or maybe you manipulate other coworkers to, to go against the boss or whatever. There's a lot of different scenarios. And not everybody is aggressive. A lot of people are covert. And they like to work their little, like a DJ in the background, just work in the disc of the department trying to get the boss in a frenzy, this condemns those actions. You are walking in sin. We should pray for our boss, whether we like them or not. Give them honor, even if you feel it isn't due, because it's not the boss you work for, it's Christ you work for. And you show God honor when you honor the authority he's placed in your life. Man, guys, this is hard stuff. We live in a very anti-authority culture, blah, 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 blah. Nobody likes listening to anybody tell them what to do. But he has put authority in your life. And some of them are not godly. Some of them are. And you're to obey all of them up until it becomes sin. 
Now, why is this so hard? It's, co- it's our culture. My rights, my rights, my rights. Peter is saying by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, it's not about your rights. It's about God's rights. And he's asked you to do these things. Verse 19. <coughs> For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin you are beaten for it? My childhood. And you endure. But if when you do good, I'm kidding. Like, no, I wasn't beaten. Please erase that uh, of the thing. I was not beaten much. It, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. In the year of 1948, in the town of Sun, Chun, uh, Sun Chun, Chun, near the 38th parallel in North Korea, a band of communists had taken control of the town for a brief period of time and executed the two older boys of a Korean pastor. The boys died as martyrs, calling on the persecutors to put their faith in Christ. After the communists were driven out, Che Sun, a young man of the village, was identified as the one who had fired the shots that murdered the pastor's sons. His execution by the new regime was ordered. The pastor requested that the young man's charges be dropped and that he'd be released into, the, into his custody for adoption. Rachel, the 13-year-old sister of the murdered boys, testified in support of her father's request. The courts agreed to release Chase Sun into the custody of the pastor for adoption. Chase Sun, the murderer of the pastor's sons, would go on to put his belief and faith in Jesus Christ and walk in his adopted father's footsteps in becoming a pastor. You see, God will take care of justice. Each man thinks he is just and right in his own eyes. But only the one who sits on the throne and sits on the judgment seat is the one who judges fairly and righteously. His scales of justice are perfect. And while we're seeking justice in our own mindsets for that unfair boss, that crooked politician, that corrupt parent, know that if justice was served, we'd all be dead and burning in hell. That if we all had to pay for our sins in this moment, that would be the eternal consequence. And that this life that we have is only a gift of God, that there might be a window of opportunity to repent and turn to Christ and put our faith in him. That we only have that because God is merciful. Because if God enacted justice swiftly and justly, we'd all be gone. All of us servanthood doesn't forget that fact. Servanthood always remembers that if I get what's actually deserving and coming to me, then there would be condemnation for all of us, not just my unfair boss. You see, suffering is a calling. Peter isn't just asking us to view suffering as inevitable under the curse. He isn't, he's not just asking us to some sort of stoic resignation to suffering just because suffering is a calling. You want a counterculture message? That's one for you. What is God's calling for your life? A lot of people walking around writing a lot of books and moving them off bookshelves. This is God's calling for your life. What is God's calling for your life? To suffer. But if our suffering is our calling, it has a purpose. Why is suffering our calling? Because it was our Lord's calling and we are no better than him. If he calls us his disciples and we follow him always, not just the ways we like, we will suffer. The path of following Christ is a path of suffering. A lot of people, they have this idea of Christianity, they're like, here's Golgotha, the hill's in front of us. There's Jesus going up, Golgotha's hill with the cross on his shoulder. We're all standing around the bottom like a bunch of cheerleaders going, yay, Jesus, yay, Jesus, I support what you're doing. And they think that's Christianity. But Christ paints a very different picture. He says, if you're worthy to be my disciple, you will pick up your cross and go up the hill with me on your own path of suffering. Not just stand at the bottom of the hill and say, I approve and cheer for Jesus. He didn't call us to be a bunch of cheerleaders. He called us to be cross bearers. 
Suffering is a calling, but it has a purpose. <coughs> that purpose is to forge in us something to be a represent, representation, an ambassador for his glorious kingdom. That purpose is to suffer for his sake that he might be glorified. That purpose is for the sake of winning others to his saving gospel. First Peter chapter 4, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name." Just for those of you familiar with the story of Job <coughs> from the Old Testament, God and Satan are having a conversation. That's my servant Job. Satan says, Job won't serve you if you stop blessing him because he's a blessed man. And so God says, okay, we'll take away the byproducts of the faith. And so he does. And so Job goes through this intense time of suffering. He loses all of his people in his life. He loses all these things. Boils come upon him. Just an intense time of suffering. His family's trying to get him to curse God. His friends are trying to get him to curse God. And Job refuses to curse God because Job understands that if Job got what Job deserved, it would be eternal condemnation in hell. And that anything, short, anything better than that, he'll accept that he didn't just serve Christ for the byproducts of what God gives, like some, like he's some cosmic vending machine in the sky. I put my quarters of, I gotta have enough faith and I gotta put my tithe in and he spits out a proverbial candy bar of everything I want. That's not God. That is a idol that we have made up in our own mind that doesn't exist. That's a, a proverbial golden calf. That's not God. <clears throat> Job refused to curse God. He knew that God was being glorified <coughs> in his suffering because God was glorified that the servanthood of Job towards God was not contingent on God giving him stuff that he wanted. So much of American Christianity is built on this principle. Praise the God of whom gives you stuff. What if... God gave us everything in the person of Jesus Christ. And we just sit here and keep wanting more. And our relationship with him is contingent on that. Shame on us. God has already given the fullness of himself. Anything else. Of course he loves blessing his children. Of course he, of course he uh, sometimes answers prayer. But sometimes he doesn't. And is your faithfulness and your servanthood towards God contingent upon whether God gives you everything you want or not? And Job knew this. He knew that God was going to have him no matter what and that, that anything that came to him was a result of God's divine providence and will and that anything that happened to him as God giveth, he taketh away. He understood all of that. And so God, Job never, he never condemned God. He never came against him. He never blasphemed him. And in return, Job was given more than he originally had and God was glorified. Win, win. And the funny thing is, is most of us that's holding on to this idea of God that I love you when you do great things for me, we're going to lose our lives anyway, because that's not the real God of the Bible. The purpose of the Christian life <coughs> is not so that we'd be comfortable and wealthy, but it would be that our calling to suffering would result in the glory of God. We think God is just glorified when his servants are doing great and are prospering, but we are called to suffer as our Lord did. We are not above him. And this annihilates the prosperity gospel message in America, completely annihilates it. Well, Josh, I think that's a bit of a stretch to say that we're, or calling is suffering. Verse 21, for to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footstep. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who just <clears throat> judges justly. He himself bore our sins and his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Christ wasn't even, this is the crazy part, like, Christ wasn't even suffering for his own sin. He was without sin. He was suffering for our sin. 
You want to talk about unfair. You want to talk about unjust. How fair is that? The thrice holy God stripped off glory, came to earth, put on humanity, suffered in every way that we were, and then died the most horrendous death that's ever been uh, masterfully created by man, the, the, the perfected Roman crucifixion, and died in our place bearing the wrath of God for all sin. You want to talk about unfair? That's unfair. But he is love, and he is salvation, and he is the glory of the heavens and the earth. He did it because that's who he is. He is redemption. He is the Almighty. He is love. It is more important to God that Christians display a faithful testimony to the gospel followed by integrity than strive for their own personal rights. It is more important that God sees his people submitted fully to his sovereignty in harsh treatment than protest their own sense of justice in the world against those put over them. And sometimes we're kind of like children. I can be sometimes in my walk in the sense that we'd love to stay home from school and not have to learn grammar and math. How many of you it was grammar? It's okay. None? You guys are all grammar? Thank you, Aaron. One. How many of you it was math? Oh, this is the math, 11 o'clock. Is that why you're at the 11 o'clock? Like that math is the, this room's problem. Like, and some of you didn't want to go because of grammar. Some of you didn't want to go to math. Some of you, how many of you just wanted to go because of recess? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we got a few. All right, so I get it. There's, there's a part to it, right? But it's in those moments when you're struggling with the multiplication table. I don't know what guy decided to make that. It's in those moments where you learn and grow and develop as a mature person and you learn things. Suffering is not just there to make us all a form of ascetic monks where we suffer as a rite of passage. It, forces, it, it forges in us growth and it refines us with fire. When we encounter trials, the spiritually mature view them as opportunities for growth and for evangelism. Those who suffer with the right attitude in this life will be blessed and they'll be honored in the Lord. Now, suffering with the right attitude is kind of hard to do. And it takes the Lord's help. <laughs> but for a person that can do that and have the right perspective, you are blessed. Let's go back to the text. For to this you have been called because Christ also f- suffered for you, leaving you an example. Hapagamos is the Greek word here. According to the BDAG Greek lexicon. So this is what this is for those of you who are like to nerd out on the Bible, and I hope that, that everybody gets that point. But the, a Greek lexicon takes the original Greek words and it teases out the senses of the words so you kind of understand how they use that word back in that time frame. Very helpful study material. The, uh, one of my favorites is called the BDAG, B-D-A-G. So buy that. BDAG Greek uh, lexicon. So what it does is it helps you understand how the word is used. You have to understand bring in, bringing a word from an ancient language to 2,000 years later when we use words like lit to describe things um, like th- you have to understand that's a big leap and there's a lot of work that has to be done there. And so the lexicons help us make things lit. So the idea is this, hypogrammos is to model or pattern and copy a writing or drawing. Um, first service set me straight on this. I guess the schools don't do this anymore, but back in the day, 19... 19- 92 Washington Elementary School, Parsons, Kansas. We use what's called tracing paper. You guys remember tracing paper? Wax, partially transparent paper. You would lay it on top of like letters and then you would draw. What would you do? The kids would draw out what an adult or a computer had already drawn. I always thought it was unfair because the computer's like perfect. You know, let's get a human to do it. But like you put it on top of there and you draw it out. Or you're an artist, you're an aspiring artist, and you put the drawing on there and you put the tracing paper and you draw with the artist you so you can kind of learn how to do it, right? So they had old school tracing paper, probably from the same store that they bought transparency paper from those old giant uh, giraffe machines that they, you know, I'm talking about overheads, overhead projectors. They probably bought it from the same store. But you had tracing paper. So the idea here, uh, Hippogramos, is that we're essentially taking tracing paper, putting it on top of the work that Christ already did, and we're, we're, we're tracing. 
the example that he set. Now understand this, we're not following his journey in the sense that we're all going to pack up this afternoon and head out to Israel and go up Golgotha ourselves. There's only one person, God in the flesh, that could carry out that particular calling from God the Father. What I'm saying is God has you somewhere, your job, your place, your wherever he's placed you, and what he wants you to do is put that tracing paper on top of what he's modeled for you and draw it out so that when people revile you, you don't revile in return. Then when people spit on you, on your way to dying for them, you don't spit back. That when people kick you when you're down or they get together as a mob and they try to push you off a cliff because they don't like what you're preaching, you just slip out of the group and you just keep preaching. That's the hippogramos. That's the tracing what God, Jesus, our model and example has laid out for us. Now, here's an example look like this. He committed no sin. Obviously, that's not possible for us. Well, he that says he's without sin, <coughs> there's no truth in him. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the idea here is that in our process of following out God's plan, we don't sin, and that when we do, we repent, we turn to him, ask for forgiveness, ask for the grace to, to, to fully walk away from that. We are judicially declared righteous before God because of what Jesus Christ did, although we understand in these mortal bodies in this time until we die and we stand before him, we're going to have issues with confronting sin. They committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. We don't have to lie on our way there. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. I'm not just looking to get everyone back at what they did to me. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Even Jesus, the son, is looking to the father, the one who sits on the throne and saying, father, you will make you will line the goats and the sheep up and you're going to take care of all of the judgment in the end. I don't have to do that. I don't have to get in your way. And how many, how many of you, don't, don't raise your hands because if you'd be honest, probably be all of us to some degree. How many of you, this is a really hard thing to do because you would really like to take justice into your own hands? Our justice is skewed. It's perverted. It's, it's contorted. It's bent on our own bias. It's corrupted by our own flesh and sin. We entrust Christ to help us. We entrust him to help us repent of our sin. <coughs> we entrust Christ to help us not return evil with evil. We entrust Christ to help us reserve judgment for the one who judges justly. Now, that doesn't mean that you, ig you ignore a brother's sin. We have a responsibility in the church. If you see a brother who's sinning and, and, and offending and bringing issue, then you have to bring that issue to him. Scripture calls for us to do that. That's not making judgment on their soul. That's helping a brother stay within the confines of disciplinary of the Lord and not falling into condemnation. 2 Corinthians 4, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You Sometimes in the middle of your situation, you just got to stop just referencing the things, that you, the things that you see with your eyes. Look beyond that and look at it the way God does. It was very easy to come home from a really long day, and I get it, I've, I've been in that situation. Come home from a really long day, and your boss called you out in front of people for something you didn't do, and, and, and embarrassed you, and all these things are going on, and I get it, it's so, it's so frustrating, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know why I'm doing this, I feel like garbage, and you come, it's really easy to just stare at all those things, but Christ is saying, yeah, but John, sitting in the cubicle next to you, he's one of mine. And he needs to know the truth. And I put you there to preach the gospel to him and share your testimony. So buck up, buttercup. Put your work pants back on tomorrow. And you go to work and you preach the gospel to John. And you smile at your boss. And you keep going. For me. For my glory. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. We think everything in this life is such a big deal, but this life is so transient, it's so short, it's so temporary, and eternal is so long. And in eternity, we're going to be looking back at all the things that we thought were such a big deal, all the things that stressed us out, and we're going to say, man, that was nothing. I really wish in those moments I would have been faithful. 
2 <coughs> Corinthians or 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we endure, we will reign with him, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Hebrews 2.10, for it was fitting that he, for whom by all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Our salvation is made perfect through suffering. It is the suffering that forges the fire and refreshes finds us and makes us into the more of the image of Jesus. And that's something we should all be shooting for, not so we can walk around and say, look how Jesus-like I am, but so that we can bring glory to God, so the more people may know him. First Peter chapter 1, we studied this a few weeks ago. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Man, this, this is the point. This is, what it's, this is the most important thing. This is what it's all about. Nothing else matters in the grand, the grand scheme of things other than that we be, bring glory to God. And God said, I receive glory when my people are willing to, to walk the path of suffering I've called them to because their Lord was called to suffering and they're not greater than them. And if they will do that, I will forge in them something greater than gold. And I'll use them in ways that they could never imagine. And when I say that, man, people always start, I'm gonna sell a lot of books and stand on stages and be really popular and have lights shine on me. This is overhyped because these are really bright. What I'm saying is that you have to understand that it doesn't always look like you think it is and that God has a path that's set out for you and some of you, you're avoiding that path because it has suffering as a contingent that's tied to it. And you keep running from it and you keep dodging it and you keep, you keep blaming other people and making justifications for yourself but God's called you down a journey and you know it and you're avoiding it because it's hard. It's always gonna be hard. God designed it that way. It's always going to be hard. It's always going to mortify your flesh. It's always going to cause you to have to die to yourself. It's always going to cause, you know what? It's going to almost always hit you right where it counts, right in the idols. It's, it's going to swing at things that you love more than Christ and you didn't realize you loved more than Christ. It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect people around you. I'm telling you, though, it's worth it. Because our end goal in everything in this life, the only thing we have left to do until God says, no more breath, is to glorify God. Stop running from your calling because suffering is attached. It don't matter what, suf- what calling you chase. If it's a genuine one, it always has suffering. And that suffering, it doesn't have to be a thing, guys, where we walk around like a bunch of Eeyores. Oh, woe's me. I've got another suffering. And we wear it as a badge. Some people wear suffering like a badge, like I'm an Eeyore and I'm just, I'm just uh, doing these things for Jesus. That's not what it's about either. But what happens is when there's this, there's this like divine transaction that takes place. When we're willing to subject ourselves to the will of God in suffering, God is glorified. And then when God is glorified, he returns back to us peace and joy and love. And a lot of us, the reason why we don't have peace and we don't have love and we don't have a joy is because we're actively resisting the very things God has called us to where we will find that at, in that process. Father, we thank you, Lord.